<coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, dear researchers, uh, participants, uh, and followers uh, via social media, Assalamu alaikum. On behalf of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies, I would like to welcome you uh, for this uh, to this uh, seventh Gulf Studies Forum. This is an annual event uh, that was launched by the Arab Center in December 2014 in order to present a platform to study the affairs of the uh, Arab Gulf and its uh, political, cultural and social affairs. And it brings together uh, researchers uh, and uh, academicians uh, in this part of the world. And uh, this forum continued throughout the years despite uh, the difficult times witnessed in the Gulf, and uh, it received a high level of participation and efficient uh, uh, presence. We had six uh, uh, versions, and this is the seventh forum, and uh, it covered social and economic reforms in GCC countries. The second uh, forum talked about uh, education and its challenges. The third one, economic diversification in GCC countries uh, in light of the dropping oil prices. In December 2017, we had the fourth forum and it covered the blockade on Qatar according to two themes. The first one, social media and media and if it had any impact. And the second theme uh, tackled the regional and international positions and the future of the GCC that was hit by this uh, crisis, the blockade of Qatar. The fifth forum covered the transition at the level of transformation at the level of the society, in addition to the GCC US relations, and we issued or published a, a book and we uh, two months ago, and there will be another book regarding the uh, trans, uh, transition and transformations at the level of the society. Last year, we talked about uh, policy making and GCC and the security of the and a changing environment. During this forum, we will tackle the situations uh, in the GCC countries uh, and the main issues, uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds and investment policies of the GCC states that were key uh, during the coronavirus uh, and the drop of oil prices. The second uh, theme will be the GCC's relations with Iran. We have 32 researchers from 23 universities and uh, centers. Uh, we have 13 papers regarding sovereign funds and uh, other the relations with Iran. Because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic, we organized uh, this year's uh, forum through Zoom, and it has its positive aspects uh, and its negative aspects. Uh, of course, uh, we will miss the human aspect and the interaction of the participants, but on the other hand, we expect uh, a, a larger number of participants uh, uh, through the platform. The forum was organized uh, for five days uh, in evening sessions uh, for us and morning sessions for the United States because we have a large number of participants uh, this year from the United States. And we were keen not to have more than two sessions every day in order to determine or to guarantee active participation and having one session only per theme. This is why we will have each day one session regarding the sovereign wealth fund and the GCC uh, relations with Iran. Every researcher will have uh, 15 minutes to present uh, the paper and we will allow uh, for Q&A sessions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, throughout the seven years, this forum was considered one of the key research centers uh, every first week of December of every year. Researchers from the region and the world participated and presented their papers, and we are witnessing an increase level of participants every year 
using the email to submit their papers. And uh, throughout the four forums uh, and the four last years, we, in addition to this year, we had more than 300 researchers from all over the world who presented papers regarding politics, culture, society, social diversification, cultural diversification, general policy making. And this year, when it comes to sovereign wealth funds and investment policies, we would like to thank you all for your participation with us. And we invite you to continue to do so during this year's forum. I will start now after this short introduction. I will start with, or we will start with a lecture by the keynote speaker. I would like to welcome Dr. Giacomo Luciani, who is going to deliver a presentation entitled Dilemmas of Sovereign Wealth Fund Management. Professor Luciani is a renowned personality all over the world, and he has many contributions. And please allow me to introduce him in a few sentences. Dr. Giacomo Luciani teaches at the Paris School of International Affairs, Sciences uh, for Sciences Po, and at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva from 2010 to 2013. He was a global scholar at Princeton. His work focuses on the political economy of the MENA region. And uh, together with uh, Hazem Biblawi, he edited the book 1987, which is frequently cited as one of the origins of the uh, concept in his uh, latest co-edited book, When Can Oil Economies Be Deemed Sustainable? He discusses the consequences and challenges of sustainability for the GCC economies. And before allowing uh, Dr. Luciani to deliver his paper, I would like to remind you uh, regarding key uh, points. Interpretation into Arabic is available. Please choose Spanish in order to get the Arabic interpretation. So please choose the logo of Spanish and of course English for English. And when it comes to the participation, the researchers from the Arab Center and also uh, participants, other participants could raise their hand should they intervene, should they want to intervene. And please, uh, dear guests, uh, have very straightforward and brief uh, uh, contributions. Uh, when it comes to our followers uh, via social media, uh, the questions will be uh, delivered through the platform. Dr. Uh, Giacomo Luciani, you have the floor, sir, in order to give us the keynote lecture. Dr. Luciani, you have 30 minutes, and then we will have uh, questions and answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marwan. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to intervene at this uh, Gulf uh, Studies Forum. Uh, as you say, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to being online. And uh, perhaps uh, one advantage is that it fa facilitates participation. And it's also uh, my pleasure to see uh, several friends uh, uh, who are connected and listening to this, uh, to this uh, webcast. Uh, the topic uh, uh, today is about uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds. And uh, one must say that uh, uh, this is becoming an increasingly popular uh, topic because the number of sovereign wealth funds uh, is in fact uh, uh, increasing, although they are not always called uh, uh, sovereign wealth funds. And uh, at some times, uh, you know, uh, institutions are called sovereign wealth funds when, uh, in fact, in my opinion, uh, they uh, should be uh, characterized uh, under a different uh, uh, rubric. Uh, so what I will try and do this today is to uh, perhaps uh, give you some um, uh, concepts uh, to distinguish in between different kinds of uh, sovereign wealth funds and the kind of, uh, and the kind of uh, management challenges that they uh, face and how different uh, solutions to these management challenges can, uh, can lead to very different, uh, to very different results. 
I think we started uh, speaking about sovereign wealth funds when uh, um, some uh, countries, uh, notably the oil producing countries, uh, major oil exporters, uh, started accumulating large uh, foreign uh, currency reserves. Uh, it, it's not necessary to rely only on oil exports to accumulate uh, foreign currencies reserves. Uh, in, in theory, as you know, if you have um, a freely floating uh, uh, currency and you have a large surplus in your uh, balance on trade, uh, what will happen is that uh, the currency will tend to appreciate. Uh, but in, um, in the case of the oil producers, uh, the uh, foreign exchange regime is uh, a fixed peg, uh, certainly in the Gulf, although not everywhere. For example, Russia has, uh, does not follow properly a fixed peg, and this has uh, a great importance in uh, shaping the different results of Russia when oil prices uh, collapse. Uh, other countries, such as Nigeria, have also uh, resorted to devaluations. But in the Gulf, you know, there is this uh, 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 preference for a fixed peg, uh, which has been maintained for a very long time now. Uh, fixed back to the dollar. And in addition, oil itself uh, is traded in dollars. So uh, when you have a, a surplus in your balance of, of trade, the outcome is that the central bank will start accumulating, um, accumulating dollars and uh, will increase its um, reserves. Um, for as long as uh, these reserves are, uh, so to speak, relatively limited, one may discuss what is the limit, they are called the central bank reserves. Uh, but then at some point, uh, uh, it becomes clear that they will not be immediately or soon or frequently needed. And uh, that is a, a key point because uh, central bank reserves are normally um, uh, meant to uh, compensate for fluctuations uh, in, uh, in foreign trade. Uh, you may have years of surplus and then uh, some uh, years of uh, deficit and the central bank is there with uh, their reserves to compensate for this short term uh, fluctuations. Here we are talking about uh, more longer term uh, fluctuations, although one of uh, the, the, the key inspirations for sovereign wealth funds is exactly in the uh, volatility of oil and in general commodity prices. Uh, so that uh, it is said that because uh, the prices of oil are so quickly uh, changing over time, uh, uh, no country can, uh, so to speak, trust or be sure of how much money it will receive in front of, uh, uh, against its uh, uh, exports of oil. And uh, it has to protect itself in some form. And so accumulating a, a buffer stock, uh, a, a, a fund uh, whose main purpose is to compensate uh, short-term fluctuations in prices.
of the government of the oil money indirectly through the fund, but uh, it uh, uh, still is basically accumulating indefinitely. And so the question is, you know, um, when are we going to stop accumulating this fund? Okay, when is the time to to use the money? Uh, and uh, invest it, uh, uh, use it for some other purpose. The Norwegian fund only invests uh, uh, internationally. And that is uh, uh, a, uh, an important uh, thing to underline because sometimes people uh, consider uh, that uh, sovereign wealth funds can also invest domestically in the same economy where uh, they are established. Uh, in fact, you know, I have uh, doubts that whether that we may call uh, a fund that invests domestically a sovereign wealth fund in the same way as a fund that uh, uh, invests uh, internationally. Because when you invest uh, domestically, basically what you are doing, you are uh, providing equity capital to uh, some uh, enterprise. And uh, that is, uh, or even less, uh, you know, when you are investing in, uh, in infrastructure. Uh, and that is an, an old story. There is uh, uh, state-owned enterprises uh, in basically all countries. There has been a moment in time when uh, uh, it became very fashionable to call for uh, privatization and many state-owned enterprises have been privatized. But lately, I think we uh, fairly clearly see a, a return to uh, state intervention, uh, either in times of crisis to salvage uh, um, enterprises that otherwise would go uh, bankrupt, uh, or in order to uh, pursue uh, strategic goals, uh, goals that are perceived as being very important for the security or the future development of the country in, a, in, a, in advanced technology or in other areas. This type of intervention can take uh, uh, many forms. Uh, it can take the form of uh, state-owned enterprises. It can take the form of uh, um, lending uh, to uh, private enterprises or acquiring participations for a certain period of time with the intention later of liquidating these participations. In these cases, I, I, I think we should speak, be speaking of state-owned enterprises or uh, perhaps a development uh, bank. For example, Brazil has a very uh, famous and well long-established development bank that acquires some equity and uh, extends uh, uh, loans uh, to, to otherwise private companies, but it's not a sovereign wealth fund, okay? You don't call that a sovereign wealth fund. For me, sovereign wealth funds are uh, uh, funds that uh, uh, invest in foreign assets uh, in order to uh, either compensate for the eventual uh, end of the oil uh, uh, rent, uh, that's one motivation, or to compensate for uh, short-term uh, fluctuations in, um, uh, in the price of uh, uh, exports, be they oil or other commodities, because the same can be said uh, for most uh, minerals and also for most uh, agricultural commodities that have uh, the same fluctuations. So uh, we also have, um, uh, you know, uh, funds that are established by, by countries uh, that are not, are neither uh, oil exporting uh, uh, nor uh, uh, commodity exporting countries. Uh, and here, you know, uh, they are normally not called uh, sovereign wealth funds, although in fact, this is what they are. And, uh, here uh, I have uh, uh, in, in front of my eyes the example of uh, Switzerland, uh, where the Central Bank of Switzerland, uh, the National Bank of Switzerland, uh, has been intervening in the currency market in order to uh, prevent an appreciation of the Swiss franc, which uh, 
uh, would be very damaging for the, the Swiss real economy. And uh, in this way has been uh, accumulating uh, international assets. And by uh, the end of uh, uh, 2019, uh, the Swiss uh, National Bank was sitting on a sovereign wealth fund of the order of 800 uh, million uh, Swiss francs, 800 billion, uh, uh, sorry, Swiss francs. Uh, so uh, about two thirds uh, the size of the Norwegian fund. No one speaks about the Swiss uh, uh, sovereign funds, not even in Switzerland, but it exists and it is uh, invested mostly in, uh, um, in bonds, but also to a significant extent in equity. So 20% of that fund is invested in uh, equity of international corporations, okay, in the United States, uh, in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, now, uh, there again, you know, uh, this, this fund has been growing and growing and growing and, and uh, the perspective into the future is that it will only grow because uh, unless you may believe that at some point the Swiss economy will face some uh, terrible crisis uh, for, for reasons that are impossible to, to, <laughs> to imagine, uh, then, uh, you know, there is uh, always going to be uh, the necessity to make sure that the Swiss franc does not appreciate too much relative to, to, to the rest, uh, uh, especially relative to the euro. This is the problem, you know, Switzerland is a small country surrounded by the euro area and uh, if they allow the Swiss franc to um, appreciate relative to the euro, uh, the domestic economy will be ruined, uh, will cease to be competitive. So uh, here again, uh, like in Norway, we have a situation in which uh, the fund accumulates uh, forever and ever and uh, one wonders uh, what the end game uh, will be. Uh, in the case of Switzerland, it's a bit different, uh, but not so much different from uh, from Norway. Norway in Norway, the the fund has a percentage that they can transfer to the government every year. In Switzerland, it's a fixed sum; uh, they can only uh, transfer uh, up to uh, two uh, billion uh, francs uh, to the government uh, uh, every year. In uh, last year alone their profit, the profit of the fund was 49, 49 billion uh, francs. So out of 49, they are transferring two. In fact, you know, in extraordinarily this year, they will be transferring four, but that's less than 10% of the profit, uh, not to speak uh, of the size of the fund. So they are accumulating and accumulating and accumulating. So the question is, um, at some point, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, a certain probability that uh, the role of these uh, funds uh, will be challenged. Uh, it will be challenged either uh, domestically, because uh, the people uh, in Norway or in Switzerland or uh, in any uh, country that uh, finds itself in this situation, will start asking why are we paying uh, so many taxes when uh, uh, the government is sitting on top of uh, a, a, such a huge uh, uh, pile of money and accumulating it, you know, it's, um, uh, what good is it at some point, okay? You have to ask yourself. And then also the other, uh, the other challenge is uh, uh, how should this money be invested, okay? So, uh, is it good to, to buy bonds of foreign uh, governments like uh, uh, is primarily being done by uh, the Swiss National Bank, for example? Uh, do, do, you, do you want, uh, do you need to buy equity, equity in companies, in which companies, okay? Norway is spreading uh, their uh, equity uh, purchases uh, over a huge number of companies. And uh, then, uh, you know, uh, very inevitably, I would say, the question arises, uh, 
do you want to uh, purchase the equity of every company or do you want to be selective? I mean, is there some criterion uh, for you to buy? Um, and so, for example, the Norwegian uh, fund has decided, paradoxically, if you wish, not to buy, no longer to buy and to divest uh, uh, shares of uh, oil and gas and coal uh, companies because uh, they think they are damaging for the environment. But then, you know, they also are starting to intervene in the governance of companies. Uh, for example, you know, at the moment they are insisting that the position of chairman of a company be separate from the position of uh, CEO. Now, this is um, uh, something which is widely accepted as uh, a form of good governance, although not all companies uh, uh, accept and do this. But, uh, you know, the next step might say, you know, this company should not uh, invest in this country or should, uh, you know, what are the, the social practices? What are... Uh, uh, yeah, so many questions, okay, that you can can raise and start uh, questioning uh, the the wisdom for a sovereign uh, wealth fund to invest in one or another company. So uh, that uh, is bound to create uh, um, a, a fear that there might be uh, intervention, uh, uh, politically motivated intervention, because. Uh, sovereign wealth funds might decide uh, to uh, suddenly uh, divest, uh, sell or not invest in uh, uh, the companies or assets of a specific country for whatever reason. In, uh, you know, we have witnessed an increasing politicization of uh, international trade. Um, this has uh, come to the fore, especially under the Trump administration, uh, but not uh, exclusively there. We unfortunately witness a, a, a case of politicization of uh, international trade uh, within the GCC itself. And, uh, and uh, this uh, leads us to, to the question whether sovereign wealth funds will be uh, able to invest uh, 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 along purely uh, purely financial criteria or uh, will need to take into account uh, other criteria as well and what kind of implications uh, uh, this might have uh, down the road in the acceptance of, uh, uh, of what they do. Uh, so uh, that is uh, a, a, a problem which is uh, um, wide open. And then there are also uh, sovereign wealth funds uh, whose uh, management is uh, uh, not investing on a wide spectrum of companies, but targeting specific, uh, uh, specific companies, buying significant uh, shares of uh, specific companies. Generally, this has the advantage that you can uh, acquire a voice in these companies, uh, so you will be able to uh, make your interests uh, heard as a sh shareholder. Uh, it is frequently um, uh, it, it is frequently uh, implied. I would say that uh, perhaps this will uh, this uh, possibility of uh, voicing one's interest will be utilized in order to uh, uh, modify or influence the strategy of the company for example come and invest in my country uh, or uh, let's uh, uh, transfer some of uh, the know-how uh, some of the technology uh, let's get some other benefit out of the fact that I am your shareholder to the tune of uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 percent in some cases. Uh, so in, an important shareholder. And uh, uh, so in this way, I can, I can influence uh, uh, the, uh, the strategy of the, of the company, the behavior, the decision making of the, of the company. 
Of course, uh, uh, picking uh, winners in a sense, selecting specific companies to invest in uh, may have uh, benefits, but it may also mean that you have added the risk. And this tells, uh, takes us to, to, to the point of, uh, you know, uh, are sovereign wealth funds necessarily always successful? And the answer obviously is no, because when you are investing in equities, uh, you are always uh, taking uh, some risk. And if you invest in uh, non-equity assets, uh, such as uh, real estate or derivatives and so on and so forth, you are taking even more risk. There is potentially uh, higher uh, profit to be made, uh, higher, higher gains, but also uh, also uh, potentially higher losses. So um, what is the degree of risk that a sovereign wealth fund should uh, um, underwrite? Uh, and uh, that is uh, a, a, a difficult question because, uh, you know, the, the assumption always is that uh, uh, by investing uh, in equities, by investing internationally, you will be able to preserve uh, at least or multiply the value of your assets. Uh, but, you know, this um, implies that there is not a major international crisis uh, because if we ever uh, go uh, towards a major international uh, financial crisis, uh, then uh, the, the, the value of uh, some of the sovereign wealth funds might uh, quickly uh, evaporate or be drastically reduced and then you know you will uh, we will you will be faced with a situation uh, whereby you have uh, for years uh, exported oil and gas accumulated uh, financial assets accumulated uh, a sovereign wealth fund and you find yourself with uh, uh, major losses uh, because uh, your assets are no, no longer uh, as uh, prized as they were in, in the past. So, uh, you see, uh, I think we have to be uh, very critical and looking at the details of uh, sovereign wealth funds, how they are uh, created, how they are uh, established, and... Uh, uh, how they are managed and what kind of uh, investment decisions uh, uh, they make. In a context in which uh, governments are increasingly uh, increasingly intervening in uh, uh, financial markets and uh, in doing so, they are increasingly uh, accumulating uh, assets uh, that are uh, also related to uh, the uh, real uh, economy. Uh, so uh, it is not just uh, uh, the oil producing countries, it's not just the commodity producing countries, it's uh, also uh, the industrial countries that, uh, especially in the past uh, few months and years, in order to uh, resist uh, uh, from falling into a recession, uh, have been uh, adopting uh, policies of uh, uh, of financing the economy, which are implemented through the acquisition of assets from the economy. And, uh, and uh, that uh, is something that uh, uh, down the road will lead inevitably, uh, if it is continued uh, to the current pace, either to the recreation of a large state-owned uh, uh, sector uh, or uh, to substantial questions being uh, asked about uh, why are you investing in this company rather than this other one and uh, why are you keeping uh, uh, this company alive rather than allowing it to, to go bankrupt when it does not uh, have much of a future these are all questions that are being debated daily in our newspapers uh, and i think uh, uh, they are extremely uh, relevant for the future Okay, uh, that's uh, uh, what I had um, uh, to say, and I'm uh, happy to take uh, questions. Thank you, Jazeera, and uh, 
دكتور لوشياني على هذه المحاضرة. Thank you, Dr. Lu uh, Dr. Luciani, for uh, this lecture uh, in which she talked about uh, the dilemma relating to the management of uh, sovereign wealth funds. Of course, uh, God willing, in the coming days, we will be hearing more about this topic from a number of participants. I will now allow questions, whether written questions or Interventions, please be as brief as possible, dear fellow researchers. Mr. Aqil Ali, you have something to say? So, uh, do we have uh, questions by the participants? regarding this topic. Could Mr. Uh, Aqil uh, write his question down because uh, it is obvious that he is not able to use the voice feature. So please write it down. So could Mr. Aqil send me a written version of this question and we would pass it to Dr. Luciani to get the answer. In the meantime, if you have any questions regarding these challenges uh, to managing the wealth funds, sovereign wealth funds, it would be a pleasure to hear your questions. Okay, so there is a question uh, Dr. Luciani, do you foresee that GCC uh, sovereign wealth funds withdrawing more money to face the current uh, twin crisis? So uh, the coronavirus collapse of uh, oil prices. Also, uh, uh, from a sharp newspaper, how do you evaluate uh, the return of uh, the uh, Qatari uh, uh, wealth uh, sovereign wealth fund, and what are the challenges? that the Qatari uh, sovereign wealth is facing in the future. So let us start with these two questions. Could you please answer these two questions? And uh, we will be waiting for more questions, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think uh, at the moment, uh, uh, of course, we live uh, through uh, two crises, uh, and uh, uh, these two crises are interrelated because uh, the low oil prices are uh, partly uh, or mostly, I would say, due to uh, the COVID uh, crisis that has uh, uh, determined a, a decline in uh, the demand uh, for oil, uh, which is uh, unprecedented. We have never seen something of this kind uh, uh, for decades, uh, if ever. So, um, the two crises are interrelated, and uh, one would uh, say uh, that this is exactly one situation in which uh, the sovereign wealth funds uh, should be uh, resorted to in order to compensate uh, for uh, what is a temporary uh, shortfall of demand. Uh, it is uh, uh, to be expected that uh, a crisis like uh, COVID will be um, will be overcome. Uh, you know, it's a matter of uh, uh, perhaps uh, another six months, uh, but uh, eventually it will be overcome. So, in that sense, uh, it is uh, possible to uh, predict, and everybody predicts uh, that there will be. A, an up uh, an upswing uh, in uh, the international economy the international economy will uh, will improve and with that uh, the the demand for oil uh, will also improve now uh, this uh, uh, happens uh, in a context in which uh, you know over the past 10 years, uh, over the 2010, for a certain number of years, until 2014, uh, the prices of oil were uh, 
exceedingly high uh, and uh, to an extent that uh, stimulated production from uh, uh, many expensive uh, sources and uh, eventually uh, became untenable. So uh, the COVID crisis has come on top of uh, a period of uh, low prices, which were the reaction of excessive uh, prices previously. Uh, will we uh, go back to a period of equilibrium of uh, reasonable prices uh, that uh, allow some, but not all, uh, the high cost producers uh, to uh, come to the market and, and uh, contribute to the global supply of oil? Uh, if that's the case, uh, then uh, you know the conclusion will be that um, we can have uh, stability at a level of prices somewhat higher than uh, uh, than we have uh, today. Uh, and uh, one needs to then uh, adjust to that level of prices. So then you need to reduce government expenditure and make or develop alternative sources of government revenue and make sure that uh, your uh, government budget uh, your government finances are in equilibrium. So uh, I think at the moment uh, there is good reason for utilizing the sovereign wealth fund funds to compensate uh, for the shortfall in income. Uh, at the same time, uh, I also believe that there is a need to uh, adjust uh, government finances uh, to the new reality, which is a level of uh, oil income uh, that will be lower than in the early 2010s, from 2011 to 2014. With respect to Qatar, uh, the Qatari uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund is uh, one that has uh, uh, been managed uh, through uh, concentrating investment on uh, a limited uh, and well-known uh, uh, series uh, of uh, a number of uh, 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 important uh, equity participation uh, in, in some uh, companies, uh, banks, uh, uh, industrial companies, um, real estate uh, assets. Uh, I, you know, it's not uh, for me to say whether this uh, investment was uh, uh, wise or not wise. In many cases, it's uh, very difficult to say because these are assets that are not uh, liquid and so um, are not easily uh, marked uh, to market as, uh, as um, uh, we say technically, we don't know what their value is at any moment in time. Uh, you only discover what their value is when you try and liquidate uh, those assets, which is not what uh, the Qatar Investment Fund is, is doing at present. Qatar uh, is uh, uh, one of the countries, uh, together with um, Abu Dhabi uh, that, and Kuwait, uh, that uh, having a relatively uh, small population and, uh, and very large uh, assets uh, uh, of oil and gas especially, uh, can uh, look at uh, the possibility of accumulating a sovereign wealth fund uh, over a, lo a long period of time down, uh, down the road in the future, and in this way uh, create a source of income uh, for the government that will outlast uh, oil and gas. Uh, this is uh, a, a financial uh, strategy of diversification of assets. You pass from being uh, the owner of oil and gas in the ground to being uh, uh, the owner of a large uh, number of uh, uh, international financial uh, assets. And that uh, is uh, a potentially winning uh, uh, strategy, uh, provided that uh, there is no major uh, financial or political crisis that uh, uh, undermines uh, the, the value of your accumulated investment. And uh, uh, I think uh, that is a reasonable assumption 
uh, but you know it's something that one uh, cannot exclude شكرا شكرا دكتور لوسياني يعني فيما كنت تتحدث وردني عدد كبير حقيقة من الأسئلة عن هذا الموضوع لا أعرف إذا كان بإمكاننا يعني الإجابة يعني I don't know if we can answer all these uh, questions I'll uh, give the floor to Dr. Abdullah Abboud I think he has a comment to make please and mute yourself so that we can hear you. My pleasure, Abdallah. <laughs> Hi, Jaco. Good to see you again. Marhaban, Jaco. A small question, if I may, Jacomo, uh, and that is, uh, given, of course, the uh, economic situation and perhaps the withdrawal of some of the sovereign wealth funds to meet some of the uh, physical conditions uh, in, in, in some of these oil producing countries. Um, do you see if there is a trend uh, if they are growing or if they are being reduced? Um, um, is there anything that is new? Um, you know, given, of course, there are there is some domestic needs for for some some of these funds and related to this is to what extent do you think these uh, sovereign wealth funds do actually help with the whole dream or idea of diversification and, uh, and all those visions that have been uh, uh, created in all these, uh, especially the Gulf countries, to diversify away from oil and to have a more sustainable economy? Do you see that these uh, sovereign wealth funds can be of some help? Um, perhaps bringing technology back to uh, the country, um, as well as investing within the country. Thank you. I have another, a third question. Uh, um, a, prob a, a question from Palestine, a two-tier question. Uh, he is asking, what are the policies followed in sovereign wealth funds to guarantee that the investment in foreign workers in view of the corona crisis and the financial crisis? And secondly, uh, have Gulf countries learned from previous experiences like Kuwait uh, lost uh, a lot of money investing in Santa Fe company and others. And to what extent uh, are these sovereign funds uh, are subject to supervision and scrutiny by parliaments? I don't know if this question applies to Gulf countries or not. We'll give Professor the chance to respond to these questions now. Dr. Luciani. Thank you. Um, so first, what uh, uh, Abdallah uh, asked, uh, uh, you know, at the moment I see uh, that um, the governments in the Gulf are resorting to a, a, a several different uh, options that they have in order to finance uh, their deficit. Uh, they have a deficit and uh, because their expenditure are uh, exceeding uh, uh, the revenue, but they have uh, several opportunities, uh, several possibilities to, to cover this deficit, one of which is borrowing. In borrowing, uh, of course, international borrowing, uh, that is emission of uh, bonds, um, is uh, popular at the moment because for a variety of reasons linked uh, to COVID, but not exclusively, interest rates are extremely low. So uh, if you have a possibility of, uh, you know, uh, keeping your investment in, uh, in uh, 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 equities, uh, we know that uh, the stock exchange in the United States uh, has been doing uh, extremely well since the beginning of the year, okay? So if you had money invested in, uh, in the stock exchange in the United States, uh, you may wish to, to uh, keep it there. And uh, if you need money, you borrow some money from, uh, from a bank. Banks are 
happy to lend you money because at the moment uh, uh, the interest rates uh, are extremely uh, low. So there are plenty of uh, investors that are looking for uh, some positive return on their uh, investment and they cannot find it in uh, in uh, the assets uh, in Europe or, or in, in bonds in Europe or uh, in the United States or in other major um, uh, industrial ec uh, economies. And therefore, you know, if uh, some of the Gulf countries uh, come to the market, uh, they find that uh, they can borrow large sums at uh, convenient prices, which is what has uh, happened. Now, this is not surprising because, I mean, if I have to choose uh, in between uh, uh, buying the bonds of uh, an oil and gas producing country, uh, okay, you know, the price of oil is low today, but it will we, we will continue using oil down the road. So there is a, a certain uh, confidence in the future of uh, uh, the Gulf economies, more so than in the future of uh, so many other uh, economies. I don't want to name names now, but uh, obviously uh, if you look around in the world, uh, 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 you would prefer a bond issued by a, a, a GCC government to bonds issued by some other governments, okay? So uh, that is what uh, they are doing. Now, can sovereign funds help in diversification? There, to be honest with you, I am, uh, I am skeptical in the sense I see sovereign wealth funds as a form of financial diversification, not industrial diversification. Um, if you intend to diversify your own economy, which means investing in industry, uh, in um, activities uh, different from the production of oil and gas, perhaps I, I would say personally, preferably connected with the production of oil and gas, uh, so integration downstream or upstream from uh, oil and gas into other activities, uh, that is diversification, uh, but it is domestic investment. Uh, it's not international investment. Uh, international investment may uh, help you if you manage by investing internationally to change the decision making of the company you are investing in and, man and attracting it to your uh, country. I submit to you that in practice, this is only possible if you actually acquire the foreign company completely uh, or, or you become the majority owner of the foreign company, because then yes, you can, uh, you can appoint uh, the CEO uh, you, you can appoint the board and they will uh, decide, uh, you know, historically, this is what uh, Saudi Arabia has done uh, with Aranco. Okay, they bought the shares of Aranco and uh, they transferred the company from California to uh, Saudi Arabia. Okay, so Saudi Aranco is uh, uh, not a nationalized company is a company that was bought uh, by the Saudi government and taken to Saudi Arabia. So that is possible, that is possible. You can choose uh, a foreign company, buy it uh, and, uh, and uh, transfer, uh, transfer it uh, uh, to your own uh, country. Uh, but I think this is rare. We have not seen uh, uh, many instances um, of that. On the control of uh, sovereign wealth fund and the losses, Yes, there are, uh, yeah, losses are possible. Uh, losses are possible. Um, at the moment, uh, some people say that uh, uh, the evaluation of stocks on the stock exchange is exaggerated, that we are in the middle of a bubble. And, uh, and this uh, uh, may be uh, justified with the fact that there is a lot of liquidity that has been uh, injected into the system by uh, both the Federal Reserve Bank in the United States and the European Central Bank uh, in Europe and everybody elsewhere. So uh, we are floating in, uh, in liquidity and this is tending to uh, uh, push up uh, the value of shares. So 
what if uh, when we get out of uh, the crisis, uh, the central banks start uh, reabsorbing some of that liquidity? Uh, it, uh, it is quite possible that uh, uh, the uh, value of stocks uh, will uh, decline. So losses are possible. And Parliament, uh, Parliament uh, has uh, a, a, an oversight uh, where uh, it exists, uh, where uh, uh, it is allowed to exercise an oversight, but it is always uh, difficult because, um, uh, you know, uh, even in Norway, you will, um, you will have discussion in Parliament about uh, basic principle, rules that the uh, sovereign wealth fund must follow, or exposed, you know, the fund at the end of each year will tell parliament, uh, uh, this is what we have done, uh, this is, uh, was our investment, uh, but uh, you are not going to control day-to-day -day decisions of, uh, of the sovereign wealth fund. You need to allow uh, professionals to, um, to make uh, responsible decisions on their own responsibility. If they make mistakes, uh, they will be fired. شكرا دكتور لوسياني أنا متأكد إنه يعني في عندك كثير لكن عندي أسئلة كثيرة. لوسياني, we have many questions. I'll try and pose them quickly because we don't want to go beyond the time. Dr. Aqil Ali. is asking, is it possible to have new financial and in investment strategies to enable the Gulf sovereign funds to rely on new technologies and new innovations? There are questions uh, concerning financial oversight of the sovereign funds. This is a question from Mosa Asaf and Mosa Al Azmi. There is a question also, I don't know who asked it. The question says, what's the difference between the Norwegian sovereign fund and the Gulf sovereign funds so far as uh, international investment is concerned? Another question, what are the consequences of the changes in the exchange rates of currencies on the Gulf sovereign fund? I don't have time to ask all the questions, unfortunately, for the lack of time. I hope that Dr. Luciani can answer these questions. Maybe we can postpone the other questions to other sessions in the following days of this forum. Now I leave the remainder of the time to Dr. Luciani, five minutes, please, to answer what he can. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think the question of financial oversight is uh, extremely important, but basically, uh, you exercise uh, financial oversight by appointing a board. Okay, so there will be a, a, a chief executive officer of uh, the sovereign fund, and uh, this person will have uh, uh, people, uh, a first layer of management, uh, top management responding to him and to a board. And so you exercise uh, your oversight by appointing the board. And uh, the, the, the short answer to the question of oversight is that you should uh, Uh, appoint a good uh, chief executive officer, good top management, and a good board. <laughs> and uh, uh, that is, uh, I realize, a stupid answer, but but uh, uh, it's a reality of things. In the end, uh, you know, you have people, and these people uh, have to be uh, responsible. Um, there is only so much that you can uh, achieve by Uh, having uh, layers and layers of control. Uh, certainly, you cannot have control uh, uh, every day and so on and so forth. One uh, key thing is, uh, uh, you know, transparency. You know, being able to uh, find out what uh, the sovereign wealth fund is doing. 
And here is a major difference uh, uh, between the Norwegian and uh, the Gulf uh, uh, sovereign uh, funds. Uh, the Norwegian uh, sovereign funds uh, is very transparent. They publish a lot of information on uh, uh, their assets and what they invest in. Uh, the Gulf uh, sovereign funds are uh, not as transparent. And uh, therefore, uh, what I said before, uh, that is the impression that they tend to concentrate their investment on a certain, on a limited number of companies uh, or invest in real estates, that impression uh, may be uh, misleading and may be due to the fact that when they uh, make a large investment decision, we know of that. While, uh, uh, you know, when they make lots of other uh, decisions and, uh, and buy assets uh, in a more dispersed way, we don't know because they don't uh, publish uh, these details. So uh, that is a, a major uh, difference. Uh, I must say that in some cases, uh, uh, it is not uh, the, the institution which is called the a sovereign wealth fund, take uh, the public investment fund in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, is acting uh, as a sovereign wealth fund when they invest internationally and as, uh, as a state uh, holding uh, for state owned companies uh, in, uh, when they invest in Saudi Arabia. Okay. So uh, when they invest in Saudi Aramco, uh, they, they are not a sovereign wealth fund. They are uh, a holding uh, for a, a national company. Uh, so uh, that, uh, if you look at the value of their investment, certainly their uh, holding nature is much more important than uh, uh, the sovereign wealth fund uh, uh, nature. Uh, but, uh, the exchange rate uh, of currencies influences uh, the, um, the value of your assets because you are uh, investing in foreign assets. You are investing in assets that are denominated in dollars, in euros, uh, in uh, yen or whatever. So uh, if uh, uh, the dollar uh, loses value relative to uh, the euro and so on and so forth, then uh, your uh, assets in dollars will lose, uh, uh, will lose value. But your currencies are uh, pegged to the dollar. And so for you, you can never lose uh, for investment in, in dollars for as long as you are, uh, nor gain uh, as long as you, are, uh, as you are pegged to the dollar. And uh, if uh, the dollar uh, de depreciates relative to the euro, the value of your fund, which is calculated in dollars, will increase. So uh, that is uh, how, how uh, currencies influence uh, the value of sovereign wealth funds. Thank you very Dr. Luciani. Thank you very much, Dr. Luciani. Uh, we hope to have more time, really, so that we can ask all the questions. In fact, we received a lot more questions than we could reply to. I invite all uh, our colleagues who ask questions to keep following us. We still have four more days. The question of uh, sovereign funds will be discussed again and again and the investment policies, policy, so hopefully we'll have more time. At the end of this session, I would like to express my deepest gratitude to Dr. Giacomo Luciani for his valuable presentation and thank all the colleagues, the participants, attendees who ask their questions. I think we have a break now, ladies and gentlemen, for 10 minutes, not 15, because we took a few more minutes extra. We'll come back after that to the second uh, theme, which is related to the relations 
between the GCC countries with Iran. We have three distinguished speakers. We have uh, Professor Juan Cole. He will speak on the geopolitical struggle between the GCC and Iran. And Dr. Abdullah Al-Gailani on the Gulf-Iranian relationship. And Dr. Ross Harrison, he will speak on the GCC versus Iran law intensity war. The session will be chaired by Dr. Ghanim al Najjar. We'll take a 10 minute break and resume afterwards. Thank you, Dr. Luciani. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for being with us. Thank you. Bye bye. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been given the cue to start. And uh, first of all, this is the Gulf and uh, the seventh session of our forum, the forum on the Gulf and the uh, and uh, this is a good thing. In fact, uh, uh, we we uh, we are into the seventh session, and we are we were rescued by a Chinese person who invented Zoom, and Zoom now is widespread and is able to enable us, in fact, to deal with the aftermath of the Corona crisis. Today's uh, today, not this following session will be on the GCC's relations with Iran. I think whoever planned for this discussion couldn't have chosen a better time than this. Uh, yesterday, many events uh, have taken place place uh, whether the whether the elections in the united states uh, or the assassination of fakhri zada and uh, any possible repercussions and added to that uh, a lot of uh, or things which are some are known to us and some may not be known Today's panelists have a wide-ranging experience. We'll start uh, with Mr. Juan Cole. He doesn't need any introductions. Uh, he is uh, from the Michigan University, professor of history. He has many publications to his name. A uh, prolific uh, writer, wonderful books, and we benefited a lot from his knowledge. He is the author of Engaging the Muslim World, the New Arabs, uh, Muhammad, Prophet of Peace Amid the Clash of Empires, uh, and many others. I'm sure he will help us come up uh, with uh, uh, perception and understanding of what's happening. Uh, Professor Cole. Well, thanks to the uh, Forum for inviting me to speak. Uh, it's an honor to be here among you, and uh, thank you for the kind words, uh, Dr. Ranham. Um, my paper really is about geopolitics, and uh, I'm a historian. So, you know, in the 19th century, we talked about spheres of influence among the great powers and competition for those spheres of influence. Many uh, contemporary observers believe that the age of spheres of influence has passed. Uh, but I'd like to argue, uh, based on recent political science literature, that actually the fall of the Soviet Union uh, in 1991 uh, opened up spaces for regional competition among local powers uh, for uh, spheres of influence. 
And by spheres of influence, I mean where one country attempts to uh, influence another so heavily as uh, ideally to exclude the other local powers uh, from uh, uh, that influence. Uh, and so I, in my paper, I took um, of four uh, case studies of uh, GCC competition uh, with Iran for regional spheres of influence. And they are uh, Lebanon, Syria, Pakistan, and Yemen. Uh, and then I attempted to trace uh, the uh, outcome of this uh, struggle for influence in each of the four over time. And my main thesis is that in the 20th century, the GCC uh, really had uh, Lebanon as a sphere of influence, uh, Pakistan, uh, Yemen, uh, and um, and to a large extent, and at least in the 70s and 80s, even, even Syria, uh, and that what has happened in the last roughly 25 years uh, is that in the cases I'm talking about, uh, Iran has become ascendant and the GCC has lost out. And it has lost out very badly. Uh, and so how to explain uh, this change? Uh, well, of course, the George W. Bush invasion of Iraq and the overthrow of the Ba'ath regime there uh, opened uh, Iraq to uh, uh, Iranian uh, influence and uh, in a big way so that Shiite religious parties, not just parties that were supported by Shiite, Muslims, but parties, one of the leading parties, uh, the, the Islamic Supreme Council was actually formed at the suggestion of Ayatollah Khomeini in the early 80s. And it has a paramilitary which was trained and equipped by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. So those are the kinds of parties that became dominant in Iraq. Uh, and although Iraq is not one of my case studies because I don't think it's in play. Uh, that created uh, new geopolitical bridges for Iran into uh, Syria and, and Lebanon. Uh, another uh, important uh, change uh, that, uh, in my view, contributed to the uh, severe loss of the GCC in, uh, in these struggles during especially the past five years uh, was the rise of uh, King Salman and uh, his son, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, who reversed many policies of, uh, of King Abdullah. Uh, and uh, Mohammed bin Salman in particular adopted policies that I think were losing policies. Uh, and so uh, to, to go into the cases a little bit, um, in, uh, in Yemen, uh, Mohammed bin Salman as, as defense minister in 2015 launched a war uh, because the Houthi uh, rebels had taken over Sana'a and come to dominate uh, the, um, at least the northwest of, of Yemen and, and, and went on down to, to uh, Aden. And uh, the Saudis and the UAE expelled uh, the Houthis from Aden, but they were unable uh, to make uh, significant progress against the Houthis in their stronghold, uh, the, the Zaydi Shiite areas of, of Yemen. And, and uh, Mohammed bin Salman's uh, strategy uh, was inappropriate to the situation because Saudi Arabia mainly launched an air war. Uh, and uh, an air war against a guerrilla group is, is a non-starter in geopolitics. It's how the United States lost the Vietnam War. Uh, and uh, unlike the United States in Vietnam, however, the, uh, the Saudis did not um, send in any significant number of troops. Uh, the UAE sent in about 5,000 
Uh, they attempted to ally with uh, anti-Houthi forces, whether nationalists in the old Yemeni army uh, or uh, the Herak, the, uh, the Southern uh, Transitional Council uh, in the Hadramaut. Uh, but uh, th those, uh, those forces simply weren't sufficient, even with Saudi and UAE air power to make headway against the, the Houthis. Uh, so there's been a standoff at Taiz, there's been a standoff at Hodeida, uh, and uh, one doesn't know the future. It, it, the Houthis are under a lot of pressure, and Yemen has become a basket case. It's among the poorest countries in the world. It's on the verge of famine. Uh, it, it, most people are not starving to death, but they're uh, one meal away from it. They're, uh, they're what the UN calls food insecure. Uh, there have been outbreaks of cholera. Uh, we have no idea uh, what COVID is doing to them. Uh, so uh, millions of people are, uh, have been uh, affected by this war in, in dire ways, uh, which has also turned the international community against the war and, and reduced support uh, for the Saudi and UAE, UAE initiative. Uh, and uh, the US Congress, both houses, and including Republicans, uh, joined to withdraw the United States from support for the war. Uh, that was vetoed by uh, President Trump. It won't be vetoed by President Biden. So uh, the, 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 uh, the, the disaster in Yemen uh, is, is uh, yet to unfold fully. And I, I think it's a big loss uh, for the GCC. Um, and uh, uh, of course, the, the Saudi line is that the Houthis are cat's paws of Iran. Uh, this is a, an oversimplification of a more complex situation where Zaydis are not very much like 12er Shiites. They don't have ayatollahs. Uh, they, they, they don't have the idea of the guardianship of the jurisprudent or Wilayat al faqih uh, They don't have uh, Ayatollahs at all. So uh, there's no question of them ruling. Uh, and um, many Zaydis uh, are dismissive of many uh, 12 or Shiite practices. And many Zaydis are actually uh, close, uh, closer to Sunnism in some ways. Uh, and so, um, you know, depicting uh, Zaydi Shiites as, as naturally pro Iran is, 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 is silly. Uh, Iran has supplied uh, some. Uh, rockets and war material to the Houthis, um, smuggling it in uh, through Hudaydah probably. Uh, and they have sent some money, uh, some tens of millions of dollars, possibly some hundreds of millions of dollars, but nothing really significant in geopolitical terms. The, the, I mean, this, imagine the billions that the Saudis and the UAE have spent on this war. So I don't think Iran uh, has command and control of the Houthis, and I don't think it's right to see what's going on in Yemen as, a, uh, as, a, as mainly an Iranian encroachment on a Saudi sphere of influence. But there has been Iranian encroachment on a formerly Saudi sphere of influence to some extent. Uh, other problems are that the UAE uh, backing the Hirak or the Southern uh, Transitional Council uh, and the Saudis backing the nationalists around uh, um, President uh, Abdurrabu uh, Mansour Hadi uh, actually have come into conflict with one another. Uh, and uh, rather than fighting the Houthis, uh, there has been uh, an outbreak of fighting in, Yem in Aden and elsewhere uh, where the Southern Transitional Council consider uh, al-Islah, a, a Muslim Brotherhood offshoot uh, which is allied with Mansour Hadi and his nationalists uh, as what they call Al-Qaeda. They consider Salafis Al-Qaeda. Uh, some of them are old leftists uh, from uh, uh, earlier in Yemeni history when the South was dominated by the left. Uh, and uh, so they have actually fought with one another. Uh, and um, uh, that obviously has been uh, a big blow to any war effort against the Houthis. Uh, uh, 10 minutes plus, past, uh, Professor. Sure. Uh, so, and finally, uh, uh, the, the, the blockade of Qatar from 2017, which again 
was the brainchild of uh, Mohammed bin Zayed in, in the UAE and uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, uh, has meant that uh, the GCC, GCC itself is divided. Qatar withdrew uh, the few troops it had uh, kind of guarding the Saudi border with Yemen uh, from the Houthis and um, uh, and Al Jazeera has turned somewhat critical of this war. Uh, and, and so um, the divisions that uh, bin Zayed and uh, bin Salman have fomented inside the GCC have also detracted from that war effort. Uh, just briefly with regard to Pakistan, uh, obviously Riyadh is very close uh, to Islamabad. Uh, however, Pakistan, refuses to become anybody's puppet. Uh, it maintains its uh, independence uh, and um, uh, it, its trade with Iran has quadrupled in the past couple of years. Uh, it has had high level delegations, uh, generals and President Rouhani has visited Islamabad, Imran Khan has gone to uh, Tehran uh, and uh, Pakistan has also uh, despite the billions it gets from Saudi Arabia and the UAE, uh, declined uh, to join in the blockade of Qatar. It helped Qatar with food uh, imports. Uh, it um, negotiated uh, uh, 150,000 Pakistani guest workers uh, in in Qatar, uh, and so and, and then um, Iran increasingly is in a Chinese sphere of influence. Uh, there's uh, talk of a big uh, multi-year uh, oil deal between Iran and uh, China. Uh, Pakistan already has a $50 billion uh, Chinese-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, and so Pakistan uh, may be um, pivoting a bit uh, towards Iran and, and China in that regard. Uh, and so uh, there's been no reliable um, uh, blockade of, of Iran from the Pakistani side. Pakistan is probably about 20% Shiite. Uh, the Shiites are powerful in the Pakistani uh, parliament. And when Saudi Arabia asked Pakistan to join the Yemen war, uh, which could have been decisive since Pakistan has an excellent army, uh, the parliament uh, uh, declined and, and the Shiites in the parliament were offended that they were even asked. Uh, and so, uh, turning to Syria and Lebanon. In Lebanon, uh, the Saudis, of course, have the, the Hariri family uh, as uh, a key asset in, in, in Lebanon, uh, and Saad Hariri has often been prime minister. Um, but uh, increasingly, in the last four and five years, uh, Hezbollah has become more powerful. Uh, the, the, the Sunni um, parties lost uh, the 2016 uh, parliamentary elections in Lebanon. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, the interference of Saudi Arabia, the blatant interference of Saudi Arabia in Lebanese politics uh, was part of that. And of course we know uh, about the incident where Ben Salman essentially kidnapped uh, Saad Hariri. Uh, I think they that uh, he destroyed Hariri's credibility to some extent. Um, and the other big influence uh, that uh, I think brought Hezbollah more to the fore in Lebanon uh, and the, the April, uh, I mean, the March 6th, uh, the March 8th uh, coalition um, uh, has become more powerful in part because of what happened in Syria. Uh, my own analysis of it is that uh, Although most Christians in, in Syria and, and Lebanon were not um, fans of the Ba'ath government of uh, Bashar al-Assad, uh, they were even less fans of uh, the Salafi jihadis. And although those were small groups in the Syrian opposition, uh, they became the face of the opposition and it, it, it scared a lot of Shiites. I mean, a lot of, uh, well, of course it scared a lot of Shiites, a lot, it scared a lot of Christians as well. And so I think whereas uh, in the first decade of the 21st century in, in Lebanon, you had a, a kind of Sunni Shiite alliance against Syria. And of course, Syrian troops were uh, expelled from Lebanon uh, because of that alliance. Uh, in the past uh, 
roughly six years, uh, you've had more of a, uh, a, a Shiite Christian alliance in Lebanon since the country is. Okay, in, have one, one minute. One minute. Yeah, since, since the country is in thirds, that's uh, uh, decisive. With regard to Syria, again, uh, the Saudis backed uh, the Jaysh al Islam uh, Salafi Jihadi group. Uh, that was a mistake. Uh, it scared the minorities, uh, and uh, ultimately, in any case, uh, the Jaysh al Islam was defeated partly because of the uh, Hezbollah uh, um, intervention and the, uh, the Russian intervention. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, I, I met with uh, Syrian oppositionists in, in 2012 and they were uh, uh, Democrats and they were hoping to make a, a coalition that even included Alawis uh, against uh, al-Assad. Uh, but as the, the, the civil war ground on, um, uh, ex extremists of various sorts came to the fore. The Democrats often were exiled to Turkey or Europe. Uh, and uh, Syria is just not a monochrome country. It, it has a lot of minorities. Uh, about, I would estimate, a good half of the Sunni Arabs are secular-minded people. Uh, and so the GCC had tended to back uh, the, the, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and, uh, and, and the Saudis back the, the Jaysh al-Islam. Uh, that these groups simply were not acceptable to most of the Syrian population, in my view. Uh, and so uh, the GCC lost out uh, to Iran in Syria very badly as well. Uh, and so that's my analysis of it, that in each of these four cases, uh, the, the Iran got the whip hand over the past five years. Uh, and the GCC, because of its own divisions, uh, because it backed the wrong horses, uh, because of poor strategy, uh, because of uh, um, poor diplomacy and, and alienating people, uh, have lost uh, both on the soft power and the hard power uh, criteria. Okay. Shukran, uh, Juan, for uh, Thank you, Juan. Now we move to Dr. Abdullah Al Gailani, who is a researcher who holds a PhD from Durham University in the UK, and he regularly appears as a commentator on uh, Arab networks, on the developments in the Gulf area. He is also interested in American foreign policy, political Islam, strategic affairs of the Gulf. He has many published uh, works, uh, the last of which was uh, about the uh, Gulf security. Dr. Abdullah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ghanim, and thank you very much all ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this uh, forum it's difficult to summarize a long paper into 15 minutes but i'll do my best to shed light on the the main themes of the paper the paper basically pertains to the Gulf-Iranian relationship, the threat of confrontations and the need for reconciliation. The GCC-Iranian relations, in my estimation, is highly complex. And I don't think there are many other uh, disputes uh, in the world which have similar features to this uh, Iranian GCC struggle, because this particular one has its own features which are not found in other regional conflicts. For example, this Iranian GCC country uh, is a very complex one. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to say that uh, there is a, a translation provided 
And if you want to listen to translation into English, you click on the English button. For Arabic, it says Spanish. So the Spanish button is for the Arabic uh, translation. Sorry to interrupt, Dr. Abdullah. You compensate so you me for the five minutes you have taken. The five minutes. So, as I said, so, this relationship uh, between uh, Iran and This the complex Gulf relationship, is, as we very said. very complicated. It is multi-dimensional. It uh, has intertwining components uh, with ideological, cultural, and racial aspects. Uh, and uh, facing, for example, uh, Arabs, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Persians, uh, Shias, Sunnis. So the uh, also extension of the historic uh, Sunni state. So from this perspective, it is very complicated and very intertwined. This characteristic uh, might not be available in other conflict. And another example is that this relationship between uh, Iran and the Gulf is actually uh, linked uh, with the U.S. and Iranian uh, conflict. Uh, and this is uh, rare. So the consequences of the conflict between the United States and Iran uh, influence uh, uh, the relationship uh, between Gulf and Iran. Every time we see a uh, twist in this conflict, we see a change in uh, the nature of the relationship and, and the consequences of the US-Iranian conflict. There is also another problem when it comes to this relationship. Uh, when we talk about uh, Iranian Gulf relationship, this is not accurate because we do not have one block at the level of the Gulf with uh, common uh, concerns regarding the national security. We have different dimensions, different uh, perspectives vis-a-vis uh, -vis Iran. For example, Saudi Arabia consider uh, Iran the first uh, threat to its national security, while Oman, Qatar, and uh, to a lesser extent Kuwait have a different perspective vis-a-vis -vis Iran. So we cannot be accurate when we talk about uh, uh, Gulf-Iranian relationship, talking about two equal blocks. The Gulf uh, the countries uh, have uh, different uh, dimensions, different uh, views. Some people consider that Iran is a strategic threat uh, to the national security. Other countries uh, say that Iran is a geopolitical uh, reality that we need to deal with. Uh, so we have a multi-dimensional conflict with different uh, aspects, and it makes it very complicated. So. What is the result uh, uh, of this uh, tension that started uh, more than 40 years uh, ago? The final result uh, is that uh, there is, uh, we can talk about both parties being tired. Uh, so the Gulf and Iran, and they have both paid uh, a lot uh, or a big price for this tension. This is the clear result. The other result is that uh, the uh, sectarian uh, project of uh, Iran uh, is expanding, whereas at the Gulf level, there is a weakening. When we say that it is expanding, uh, uh, when we talk about Iran, it doesn't mean that Iran is controlling the situation and have a bigger uh, strategic power. For example, Yemen, is it an added value to Iran? What about Iraq? Is it an added value to Iran with all the political turmoil? Uh, Iran is present in Baghdad and Sana'a and also in Damascus. But, but this uh, belt that is controlled by Iran does not offer an added value to the Iranian project. And I think even also the Lebanese situation in its current uh, state is actually a strategic burden and not an added value. And uh, of course, the balance of power could shift, but the control of Iran does not offer a strategic added value. This paper considers the uh, dilemma of uh, conf conflict 
or uh, harmony or appeasement. So, uh, although Iran ex is expanding, uh, what are the possibilities uh, for a solution for a harmony or concord or peace? Uh, so, is conflict uh, the uh, final uh, result? Or uh, there are actually other possibilities uh, moving from tension to other situations. So the paper tackles the relationship from this angle using three approaches. The first one, what are the roots of the crisis? We do not want to uh, talk about the surface, uh, what we see uh, when it comes to the skirmishes and uh, conflicts uh, every now and then. We need to dive, dive in the uh, deep uh, roots of this crisis. The second point is the repercussions on the common regional security. What are the costs? What are the losses? What are the uh, hazards uh, throughout these four decades? And uh, the opportunities for a harmony. Of course, there will always be disagreement, but uh, uh, respective of these disagreements at the ideological, racial, and political. Do we have uh, opportunities, chances uh, looming in order to move from this conflict to a sort of uh, harmony and concord? When it comes to the roots of this uh, crisis, I have divided these roots in three circles. First of all, uh, the uh, producing factors and the feeding factors, uh, giving energy to this crisis and sustaining it, and uh, the circle that uh, of, of boosters that boosts this feeling on both ends uh, to continue in this conflict. So when we talk about the reasons uh, uh, the generators, we have two generators, and if we do not dismantle uh, these, or if we don't talk about the structures of these generators and review them, I think the tension between the two sides will continue. The first generator is the sectarian project of Iran. What happened in Iran was not a coup, a political coup, uh, uh, exchanging one regime with uh, another. The political uh, regime that replaced the Shah regime had a political and ideological project with political leverage. So uh, it is actually an ideological project that used the state uh, power in order to spread this uh, project uh, at the regional level and also exporting the revolution, as they said. So unless there is a shift and unless Iran actually uh, carries out uh, changes at the level of the identity of the project or its relation with the region, this will uh, remain the main generator of conflict. We know that the relations between the Gulf and Iran before the Islamic uh, uh, revolution in Iran uh, was in harmony, of course, under the umbrella of the United States, but there was uh, agreement agreements regarding the security arrangements. But the Iranian sectarian project came with different approaches, different ideologies, and consequently, this sectarian project, should it continue the same way with the same vision, I think that this will remain the generator, uh, the key generator. And also in the same circle, the first circle, the other generator is actually uh, living the uh, uh, repercussions of the Iranian-US conflict. Unfortunately, the Arab Gulf regional security is actually uh, intertwined with the repercussions uh, of the conflict between Iran and the US. During the Obama administration, we saw that things cooled up uh, between the Gulf and Iran. If the uh, Trump administration withdraws from the JCPOA, the uh, circle of tension and conflict expands. So the regional security is actually uh, linked with the US-Iranian 
conflict and the, uh, the Gulf needs to review this because the regional security situation uh, when it comes to the relation with Iran needs uh, to be uh, separated from the relationship between the US and Iran, but it seems that somehow difficult. The second circle, when it comes to the roots uh, that we talked about, is the elements or the feeders or the elements that give uh, nutritious material, energy, and uh, uh, energize these uh, conflicts and motivate the different parties to move forward. So we have a lack of strategic, common strategic definition to uh, uh, national or to regional security and also a discord uh, within the uh, Gulf. Uh, as I said at the beginning, the Gulf countries do not have a common definition of national security. Some people perceive Iran as a threat, some other uh, countries consider that Iran is a geostrategic uh, uh, re reality, geopolitical reality. So the absence of a common uh, perception when it comes to the uh, Gulf uh, national security means that countries will have to deal with this uh, individually. And now uh, the Saudi is representing the Gulf bloc and Iran, except uh, for uh, Emira Emirate and uh, Bahrain. They are actually following uh, the uh, Saudi project uh, when it comes to the uh, relationship uh, with Iran. The three other countries are actually uh, have a different perspective. They don't think Iran is actually the source of a threat a security threat in the region and there is an agreement regarding several topics several dossiers such as yemen and syria etc qatar after its crisis it was closer to iran uh, it became closer to it. so uh, it, uh, on a theoretical level a political level it used to side with saudi but now it sides or it's closer uh, to iran kuwait has a completely different approach compared to the Emirati and Saudi approaches. So there is no uh, common aspect when it comes to the definition, and uh, this uh, results in the lack of uh, a joint or common uh, perception vis-a-vis -vis Iran. This actually is one of the feeders that uh, lead Iran to deal with the Gulf bloc as a number of countries that have disputes. And also, internally, we have uh, disagreements at the level of the uh, Gulf bloc. Now, more than ever, we cannot talk about the Gulf bloc because it suffers from a lot of disputes and disagreements, and this encourages Iran to infiltrate even more uh, in the security of uh, the Gulf. And now we move to the boosters. The, the, the third circle I talked about, the boosters, which are the elements uh, pushing uh, in this direction and making this conflict even uh, worse. So, first of all, we can talk about the sectarian or racial profiling. Uh, there is actually a conflict between the Saudi uh, Saudi Arabia, in theory, representing uh, the Gulf bloc and Iran on the other. So they go back to historical elements and also racial dimensions, uh, Arabs versus uh, Persians, and also cultural aspects, etc. So this situation of uh, racial and uh, sectarian profiling and uh, going back to uh, historical elements and aspects uh, strengthen uh, these uh, conflicts, uh, although they might not be uh, directly relating to the conflict. Uh, and the uh, second booster in this circle is the absence of political agreement uh, uh, between the two uh, uh, or also uh, political 
work between the uh, educated uh, between Iran and the Gulf. So the design of uh, the uh, profiling uh, is actually a problem. The uh, educated uh, and the intellectuals, the intellectuals of Iran and the Gulf do not have inputs that lead to the reshaping of this uh, conflict and produce uh, visions and ideas regarding the nature of this conflict. The political regime in Saudi Arabia in particular and Tehran on the other, uh, they actually draw these ideas uh, unilaterally. And uh, I uh, remember one year ago or more than a year ago, uh, I attended a seminar uh, that was restricted to a number of uh, intellectual intellectuals uh, from the Gulf and from uh, Iran, and uh, they actually uh, met and during a seminar, and I was surprised to see the gap at the intellectual level between the two uh, parties. Uh, so if there is a cultural exchange between the two sides, this could actually help. You still have two minutes, doctor. You still have two minutes. So I will not talk about the uh, dangers of uh, clash, uh, which is the third aspect. I will talk about the uh, pressure at the strategic level, and we can talk about exhaustion uh, at the strategic level, the uh, armed race and the diplomatic strains. So there is uh, some sort of exhaustion uh, because of this. So are there any chances for harmony? I'm not talking here about ideals. And uh, I do not say or pretend to say that uh, this situation is going away uh, quickly. So I say that there is a chance, a big chance, and Iran is uh, a geopolitical uh, uh, reality, and it is in a position of force or power. So uh, the Gulf cannot actually uh, impose anything. And throughout four decades, uh, Iran prove that uh, nobody could infiltrate it. So there is a very real opportunity to move from uh, this conflict or clash to harmony and conquer. But the parties need to be uh, adopt uh, pragmatism when it comes to policies. So being realistic and pragmatic. One minute, one minute, doctor, please. And also uh, the second is uh, uh, distancing themselves uh, from the repercussions of the US-Iran conflict and also trying to get a definition, a common definition, uh, and also designing a regional uh, structure that could intervene to find solutions to the diplomatic disputes. And also the Gulf bloc needs to move from counting on the Americans and having some sort of cohesion at the strategic level in order to start this harmony with Iran. You need to be one bloc and uh, you need to have your uh, own level of leverage and the power cards that you can use to face the Iranian party. And six, uh, exchanging at the cultural level. So having this cultural exchange away from the official regime uh, profiling. So the intellectuals from both parties can sit down and talk and exchange culturally, which could lead to uh, uh, a product at the knowledge level and uh, takes us uh, to the harmony. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Doctor, uh, for your excellent uh, contribution with us. This is a very thorny issue. Uh, Doctor, 
Ross Harrison will deliver the next uh, presentation. Uh, Dr. Ross uh, Harrison uh, is going to join us. Uh, and I have studied uh, in uh, uh, Pittsburgh University, and uh, I actually uh, have a lot of uh, memories. And he actually focuses on uh, the uh, Middle East and the foreign policy of the United States. Uh, and uh, he's a senior fellow and director of research at the Middle East Institute in Washington. He is also on the faculty of the political science department at the University of Pittsburgh, where he teaches courses in Middle East politics and US foreign policy on the Middle East. For 16 years, he was on the faculty of the Wall School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, where he was professor and the practice of international affairs. He is the author and editor of several books. Uh, and uh, Dr. Harrison, the floor is yours. 15 minutes, please, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kandi. First of all, I want to say that it's an honor to be with all of my fellow panelists and all of those watching from around the globe. Um, my only lament is that we're not in Doha. Uh, I find that conversations about the Middle East in the Middle East are the most edifying and the most exhilarating. But given the COVID realities, uh, this is the second best thing. And as others have said, it has upside because others can, can contribute and come into the conversation. Um, I think the, the and I have a PowerPoint, but I'll, I'll make a few opening comments first. I think the, uh, the topic of the conference and this panel particularly the piece about GCC-Iran relations, is very, very timely. Timely for two reasons. One is that we've seen over the last year, year and a half, how GCC relations, GCC-Iran relations can get out of control and can flare uh, and spike into some type of open conflict. We've seen the, the, in the Persian Gulf, in the Straits of Hormuz, we've seen uh, attacks on oil tankers, we've seen the attacks on Saudi oil facilities, so I think it is an, an omen of the fact that, that this relationship can actually move from a rivalrous relationship <clears throat> into an open conflict. And so understanding the dynamics and the modalities of the conflict, I think at this time is particularly important because of the danger to the countries, to, to the GCC countries, to Iran and to the broader region. The other piece I think that's important, uh, why this is timely, is that we're, the United States has been a, a party to this conflict, as others have said. Um, and the fact that we're transitioning to a new administration, I think give us an opportunity for a reset to say, what about the US role has been constructive? Um, and what about the US role has been destructive? And therefore, what are some of the pathways forward for this very, very difficult relationship and this very, very difficult re uh, region? So I'm going to share my screen uh, and uh, start with a presentation. Um, Dr. Ganim, can you, you can see the presentation? Okay, thank you. Um, so, <clears throat> oops, I'm sorry, something is going wrong. Let me stop the share, bear with me for a minute. الحالي اي حد من المشاركين يقدر يعمل ريز هاند برفع اليد علشان any of the participants uh, uh, could raise a hand if uh, they want to participate thank you okay all right uh, we'll get started here so my my proposition uh, in my paper essentially is that GCC Iran relations have built in ambiguity. And that ambiguity is destructive and corrosive. It's not particularly helpful. Sometimes we talk about strategic or constructive ambiguity as being something that's a good thing, constructive, right? In, in the certain negotiations, in certain bargaining situations between states, ambiguity of language gives each of the parties the ability to interpret the language, interpret the negotiations uh, in their own way and allows them to claim some kind of victory and also allows them to save face with their mass publics or with their populations and with their own government. So it can be a good thing. Uh, in this situation, ambiguity in the Iran GCC relations has been corrosive and has led to, to further uh, 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 escalation of that conflict. So I'm gonna unpack that for you. Before I do that, 
let me just set the stage here. And, and I think I'm repeating what, what uh, some of the, my fellow panelists have, have already said, but, but I'll hopefully put a little different point on it. And that is that this is a region that is in the middle of transformation. Um, it's a region that is coming into its own. For centuries, the region, most part, part of the region was, was part of the Ottoman Empire. And then at the, when the Ottoman Empire collapsed after the First World War, it fell under British and French tutelage uh, and the, the, the French and the British um, essentially set some of the boundaries in the region, particularly in the Levant, and they set the agenda for the region. And then we transitioned to the Cold War, where the states that were emerging from into independence, from emerging out of the yoke of colonialism into independence, formed alliances either with the United States and the Soviet Union, and it was the United States and the Soviet Union, largely, that set the agenda for the region. And this, what we're seeing today, is a regional transformation. The, 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 the dynamic between the GCC states and Iran is just part of that transformation. It's not the entire transformation. With Turkey is a protagonist in the conflict, uh, Israel on the military side, less on the political side, but Israel's also in this mix. So we have major regional powers that are driving the agenda of the region right now. And, the, um, and it's important, I think, to see the GCC-Iran relationship in this context. The reason for that is there's a tendency to personalize the conflict, to say that Iran is a malign actor with hegemonic intentions, or on the Saudi side, critics of Saudis in the UAE might say that they're aggressive and increasingly assertive and, and uh, belligerent. Uh, so I think what looking at this within a broader regional framework and a more of a historical framework allows us to see that this is a struggle for power. It's a struggle for regional influence. And, um, and though there are personal dimensions to the conflict, it's largely structural. There's a structural change that's occurring in the region. So let me, let me talk about this ambiguity that I referred to in the relationship. Essentially, the GCC-Iran relationship is embedded in what I call a two-dimensional conflict system. And what's important about the conflict system is that it, like, kind of like a tornado, it creates an unvirtuous cycle. The, the two levels of conflict between the GCC states and Iran feed on each other. Now, let me start with the first dimension, the state to state conflict. And in this conflict, for the most part, the military aspect, the kinetic aspect of that conflict is frozen. Yeah, we do see skirmishes, as I mentioned the, in the Persian Gulf. But for the most part, there are very few territorial claims, one party to the other. UAE, obviously, and Iran is an exception to that rule. Uh, and from a military perspective, there's, there's no, um, since the Iran-Iraq war, there's been very little um, uh, military hostility expressed between the Arab states and Iran. What we have seen, though, is a, as I mentioned just a minute ago, a regional struggle for power. There is a, a, a jostling for, for influence in this changing region. And I think what's important to mention here is that it's not clear, the ambiguity comes, it's not clear what that competition really is like. Is it moving, is, is it that Iran is moving into a position of being a regional hegemon? Or are we tending much more towards a balance of power, struggling for a balance of power between the three or four different centers of power that I mentioned, Turkey, Iran, Saudi, the Arab states, and Israel. What is the nature of that conflict? Well, the nature of that conflict is not yet to be determined. It's playing out right now. But that ambiguity, what that ambiguity does is it stokes uh, threat perceptions, it stokes misconceptions, it, it, it creates lots of, of ambiguity that fuels the conflict rather than tamps it down. So how does that conflict actually play out militarily? Well, it doesn't do it on a direct basis, but it does do it at the second layer uh, of conflict, which is the indirect proxy conflict between inside what I call the soft tissue of the Arab world, these fragile or failed states, that's where the competition is taking place largely. And that's what this, and some of my fellow panelists have already mentioned this, that is where the direct state-to-state -state conflict is actually militarily playing out. It's a proxy war inside the Yemen civil war, the Syrian civil war, the fragile states of Iraq and, uh, and, and uh, 
uh, Lebanon. And there's also a proxy dynamic going on in Libya, but that does not involve Iran. That involves the GCC states and Saudi Arabia and Turkey. So this is all part of this proxy dynamic that's occurring. And you might say, well, that is fueling, the, the direct state-to-state -state conflict is fueling the civil wars. That is true. But there's something else going on here too. And that is that the civil wars are kind of giving back to the region. They are actually widening the conflict between the GCC states and Iran at the direct level. So there, there, there's this back and forth, uh, this, this, this conflict that's driven by the states the direct conflict driven by the states pushed down to the civil war zones, but the civil war zones are in effect creating almost a regional civil war, which is what we're seeing between the GC states and Iran. So this is an unvirtuous cycle that is that is fueled by ambiguity, full fueled by multi-level a multi-level multi dimension of conflict that we don't see in too many other parts of the globe. The other thing that is fueling the ambiguity is that if we look at the state-to-state -state conflict, who has the upper hand? If we think about it in terms of who has the most vibrant allies, who has the greatest defense expenditures, it's the GCC states. They have an alliance with the United States. They have a budding alliance with Israel. They have the best, um, from a qualitative standpoint, they have the best equipment and their defense expenditures are in the neighborhood of $80 billion versus Iran who has less qualitatively sound uh, equipment and spends about $14 billion. Uh, so on that stand, from that stand, and they're, they're a lot, the, the alliances that Iran has are mostly at the sub-state level, other than Syria, uh, and and, uh, and also an alliance system, a shaky alliance system, I would say, with Russia and China. Uh, so, but but when we go down to the next level, the roles are reversed. Here, Iran has the upper hand. Iran has the militias, the sub-state actors, the the soft power inside the civil war zones. And this asymmetry of capability and intentionality uh, fuels this dimension of the, this, this two dimensional conflict system. Let's move to this, the, another aspect of ambiguity that fuels the GCC Iran uh, conflict. And that is that there are asymmetric threat perceptions between the different sides. And I have to say, even though I'm an American, I happen to be broadcasting here from Germany, but I'm an American citizen. Uh, I have to say the United States in terms of these threat perceptions has reinforced the worst, not the best instincts of each of the sides. So let me, let me unpack that briefly. On the, on the Saudi UAE side, let's say the GCC side, um, they perceive Iran as an existential threat. Anytime I'm in Abu Dhabi or in Riyadh, uh, I hear, that's what I hear, that Iran is the enemy. They are the existential threat to the GCC states. Um, and what the United States has done is sort of reinforced that view. They have bought into that view and reinforced that view. And they've created the worst of two worlds. They've, they've basically empowered G, the GCC states, particularly the Saudi Arabia and the UAE. They've empowered them vis-a-vis -vis Iran and used them as the tip of the spear in their efforts towards Iran. And though because of the tentativeness of the US support, for the GC states, it's fueled insecurity. So when you have <clears throat> emboldenment combined with insecurity, that tends to create a condition under which you're not going to get too much. But no, you're, you're going to get a un, you're not going to get receptivity towards any kind of rapprochement or diplomacy. When we move to the Iran side of thing, it's not a mirror image. The Iranians don't see uh, the GCC states as an existential threat. They see the United States as the primary threat. The degree to which they see the Gulf Arabs as a threat, it's as a tip of the spear, along with Israel, tip of the spear of US efforts. And what the US has done by doubling down hard against Iran and towards their GCC countries is they have fueled that part of the conflict too. They've given Iran an incentive to entrench themselves inside the civil war zones, to, to double down on their strategy inside by pro projecting power into the civil war zones. And they've increased the sense of threat against Iran. Again, uh, work, playing to the worst instincts of Iran, not, not the best instincts of Iran. So that dynamic, that ambiguity, and that lack of symmetry in terms of threat perceptions and the role of the United States has deepened and widened the conflict. What effect will the Abraham Accords have on GCC-Iran relations? Well, it's yet to be determined. 
Uh, I would say that if the Trump admit, if, the, if Donald Trump had won the presidency, I would say that it would be quite destructive because it, w- it would have used the Abraham Accords between the UAE and Israel as a cudgel to double down further against Iran. If the Biden administration uses it as a foundation for regional cooperation and uses it as a foundation for cooperative work on climate change, on technology transfer, on economic trade uh, trade uh, transfers, um, then it could be a very positive thing that ultimately could spread to the broader region. So that's my hope for the Biden administration, but it, the jury is still out on that. And lastly, in terms of ambiguity, we're looking at ambiguity uh, of the of Iranian threat. The, the ambiguity of the Iran has split the GCC, has been as has been covered before. You have hard line blocks, uh, the hard line blocks of of um, uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Bahrain, who see Iran in existential threat terms, as I mentioned. Negotiation for them is seen as tantamount to appeasement. And then you have the more pragmatic bloc, who see Iran, I think I think it was uh, one of the previous, uh, uh, my previous colleagues who said it was a strategic or geopolitical reality. I tend to describe it, they see Iran as a rival and sometimes as a hedge against Saudi Arabia, but they don't see it as an existential threat. And they see the negotiation as a fundamental imperative. Now, the what has happened is that this ambiguity, the, the, the ambiguity of the threat itself from Iran, the fact that Iran is not really posing, it's not clear that Iran has either the intention or the capability to become a hegemonic power. The fact that Iran is really not threatening territorially uh, any of the states within the GCC. That ambiguity has widened the, the divisions between these two different blocs. And as we have seen um, before, some of this, some of the split within the GCC comes because of different economic interests. As we know, Qatar shares a, a, a gas of offshore gas oil, a, a gas field with Iran. Um, and so they see tend to see Iran in more complex terms. We see the different um, uh, domestic political realities. The, the Saudis tend to see their own Shia population as a fifth column, more beholden to Iran to, than to the kingdom. Uh, and they see Iran as playing with their Shia real, Shia with, with that Shia dynamic. And each of the states, Iran and Kuwait, Oman and Kuwait, have a historical relationship with Iran. And the other thing is that they see, particularly as we see in a more aggressive, more assertive Saudi Arabia, they see Iran to some degree as a hedge against their own GCC member, Saudi Arabia. And this this split has been, I think, accentuated and exacerbated by the ambiguity, as I said, of the Iranian threat. The fact that it's not it's not clear, it's not a frontal existential threat. It's much more of a regional rivalry. So that's incre- it's, it has actually weakened the Arab flank rather than strengthened. So really, in sum, uh, we're looking at the confluence of several factors that has made each that have made. E, um, uh, GCC Iranian relations, a Gordian knot. It's very, very difficult to untie. The two dimensional conflict system that I referred to, um, the asymmetric threat perceptions between Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, exacerbated by the, the, I think, lack of constructive engagement on the part of the United States. The ambiguity of the threat from Iran has widened the divisions within the GCC. So, how will the Biden administration affect GCC Iran relations? I, 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 I am somewhat hopeful. Because as I mentioned in my comments, I think the U.S. role has not been, particularly during the Trump administration, has not been constructed. By doubling down in support of uh, Saudi Arabia and the UAE and the GCC states and turned what was an exceptional alliance into an exclusive alliance to the exclusion of Iran has been destructive. It's played to the worst instincts of all the actors. So my hope is that if they will maintain a very, very strong relationship hopefully with Israel, the UAE, and our Gulf, other Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia and our other Gulf allies, but also rebalance the emphasis and not and, 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 and treat Iran rather than as a threat, as a rival in the region, and try to rebalance to a more balanced view, it's gonna create some friction with the GCC for sure. But I think long-term, that is probably the most constructive role that the United States can play. And lastly, just a bit of advertisement, if you're interested in these topics, uh, Paul Salem, the president of the Middle East Institute, my colleague, uh, we've we've written and edited two books on escape this conflict trap dynamic that I referred to, and from chaos to cooperation. And 
I want to thank my colleagues um, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. You've been punctual and well into the time frame, and also very uh, informative and, and good analytical framework. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the uh, now we have the Q and A, and we have at least uh, two: uh, uh, Dr. Musa Alaya and Mahanza Harrison are uh, raising their hands, but. So the idea is how to distribute. I have questions actually, I have questions on social media. So our old friend uh, Khalil Jahshan, we got uh, his uh, message. What? So uh, there are uh, banana, uh, the, the comment regarding Banana Republic. So uh, three minutes uh, each. So what I will do, I have uh, less than nine questions. So I have, nine, I have nine questions. I will have three questions addressed to each uh, because they are general uh, questions, except for the question addressed to Dr. Abdullah regarding peace uh, with uh, Israel and the opinion in Oman. So I have a question addressed to Dr. Abdullah. Please, if you can write down notes at a later stage, you can answer after we finish our uh, interventions, the interventions. Musa Asaf, how do you see the repercussions of the assassination of uh, Mohsen Fakhrizada, the Iranian nuclear scientist, uh, when it comes to the security of the region? So I will be brief. This is a question. And also Musa Asaf, uh, uh, within the uh, newly elected U.S. administration, do you think that there will be some sort of uh, Iranian Gulf rapprochement? And... Uh, the last question is to Dr. Abdullah. In light of some talks of Oman signing a peace agreement with Israel, how do you see the future of the relation between Oman and Iran? There is also a question. Uh, one, Fuad say so. How can uh, we change, uh, transform the dangers and the hazards uh, and the challenges of the Arab uh, Gulf relations with Iran to opportunities uh, that support the strategic interests of these countries? And Wajih Saman, Dr. Abdullah Ghaliani, what are the factors that can uh, motivate the uh, Gulf countries from reaction vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Iranian uh, U.S. Uh, relations to action, and uh, a question by Murad Juan. Uh, so Murad uh, on a tour. Fact: Why don't Iran and GCC sit? I'm 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 not going to translate. I'm going at the negotiating table and discuss differences. Uh, uh, this is a logical question. And also, question to uh, Dr. Abdullah. This uh, is a question from uh, Mansour al Maswari. This conflict, so is the conflict between Iran and the Gulf uh, is based on competition or uh, the hindering? of uh, the interests of the other countries. Let me start with Dr. Harrison. To what extent uh, the political uh, systems of regimes affect the nature of the relationship between Iran and the Gulf? And also another question, what is the effect of the collapse of the regional Arab uh, uh, system? For example, uh, Iraq, Syria, Egypt. So what is the influence on the tension 
between the uh, uh, Gulf and Iran, and also uh, the uh, security engagements of the United States at the international level and the Gulf level in particular. So will this lead to a reduction of local uh, domestic uh, uh, conflicts in Gulf countries? Some people or someone asked a question regarding the papers. Uh, so putting all the papers uh, together and they will be published as a book published by the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. And it has happened in the past. Four books have already been published. So we start with uh, three minutes, uh, according to the arrangement. Dr. Musa Alaya, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ghanem, and I would like to thank uh, all the uh, participants. And uh, this is an excellent uh, session and talks about key issues. I uh, have a question regarding the balance of weakness between uh, the two parties, like Dr. Abdullah said. I do not think that there is a balance of weakness. There is an upper hand uh, for Iran at uh, different uh, uh, levels, uh, whether the economic, and uh, here I'm talking about uh, production and also self-sufficiency when it comes to the food security, which is the cornerstone. Iran could have been stronger and stronger had it not been under international blockade. Uh, from a military perspective, Iran is stronger in terms of military ideology and the human factor and the cultural aspect uh, is and uh, the cultural exchange as he mentioned it is not enough i think that there should be a dialogue at the religious and sectarian level and he mentioned the fact that iran does not have a strength or a major power in the region but i say that iran has proxies in the region very strong ones and uh, is working at this level in order to show the efficiencies uh, or efficiency through the Houthis and Hezbollah. So how were these militias created and uh, linked together in the region, despite the fact that uh, Yemen, for example, and other, sorry, sorry, thank you, sorry, 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 yeah, it's, it, it's, it's clear, sorry, sorry, thank you, Dr. Musa, I'm sorry. We are really short on time. I have three minutes. No, I'm sorry. Uh, two, two, so two minutes, not three. I'm sorry. The last question is how to deal with the Yemen dossier. For example, Saudi Arabia and the UAE are fighting Iran in Yemen, but at the same time, we have uh, uh, political and military problems, so we do not know whether the uh, Saudis and the Emiratis are supporting Iraq. I'm so sorry to interrupt the doctor. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, yeah the, your idea is conveyed. Thank you, doctor. Mahnaz. Thank you. Um, I don't seem to be able to write a question. And um, my question is to Dr. Abdullah about him. In, in, in your presentation, you mentioned several times cultural uh, gathering and that the way that we can go at a solution, perhaps, or a conversation is cultural approaches. Would you possibly give some examples of what you have in mind? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh... Khalil, Fadal, or Khalil Jahshan. Shukran. Thank you, dear Dr. Ghanem. I would like to thank you all and uh, greet you all, uh, uh, dear participants. My question is addressed to Dr. Harrison, and I will ask directly in English. Dr. Harrison, I was impressed uh, and fascinated by your slide showing the mutual perceptions. Uh, in uh, Riyadh and, and in Tehran uh, regarding uh, the uh, threats uh, from each side and how it's perceived uh, in, in, in each other's uh, capital. Uh, what I found intriguing in that is comparing, uh, let's say, the Iranian uh, perception, uh, the fact that uh, the Gulf states are not necessarily a direct threat 
to them. Comparing that, let's say, with the public opinion, the Arab opinion index, the recent uh, version, 2019-2020, uh, uh, showed uh, that most Arabs in, in at least the 13 countries surveyed uh, shows that 58% of them see equal threats from the United States and Iran. So uh, even though the Saudi and let's say the U.S. Uh, perceives uh, or accepts and swallows the argument that Iran is the threat, yet Arab public opinion sees the U.S. as much of a threat uh, as uh, Iran is uh, to uh, Arabs. The same thing with the Israelis. Assessment of foreign threats, according to the Arab Opinion Index, showed us that 89% of Arabs see Israel as the main threat to them, while 81% see the U.S. as a threat. Meanwhile, only 67% of Arabs see Iran as the threat. Do you link uh, those two perceptions? Is, is the Arab opinion, uh, public opinion, closer to the Iranian uh, position on this issue? Okay. Yalla, shukran. Thank you. So now we will start with uh, uh, the answers. So we will start... Uh, just like we started uh, with one, we start with Dr. Harrison, and then uh, Dr. Abdullah, uh, you have more questions. So three to five minutes, please. So I have to, I have to cover domestic politics, yeah. regional politics, and international politics in three minutes. Okay. That I sent to you. No, no. <laughs> All right. Well, 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 let's let's try to do it as we can. <laughs> Let me answer some of the, la the last question first about uh, public opinion. Yeah, I've seen some of the same data. The, we, the Middle East Institute has an association with something called the Arab Barometer, and then in, an organization in Istanbul called Istanbul. Istanbul. And so I've seen some of that same data. What I was referring to is really the perception at the very top and in terms of the, the leadership and the fact that the Saudi leadership uh, for, and this actually answers two questions, uh, they do it for strategic purposes because I think the, the, the fact that they see Iran as an existential threat has to do with what they're seeing Iran do inside the civil war zones and, and what they see as their strategic backyard, whereas the populations don't necessarily perceive it the same way. So I agree with you, but they also do it for domestic political reasons. They, they all, each of the countries in the region have domestic legitimacy challenges. And so using Iran as the foil, using Iran as the, the, the de demonizing Iran um, has worked reasonably well, I think in Saudi Arabia, as Saudi Arabia is moving through this transition, transition of power. And so I think that the, it, it helps them domestically, but you, you accurately pointed out that does not necessarily reflect the view of the mass publics in those, in those countries. Uh, and so if you're looking for some kind of hope, perhaps, uh, it, whether in fact that there is some kind of a mirror image between the Iranian mass public view and the, the GCC or the Arab view, that hope might be that, that ultimately leadership opinion will reflect public opinion. We have not seen that in the Middle East for decades, but that might ultimately happen. Um, some of the other questions that were asked, let me go back. There was one about the assassination of Iran's nuclear, major nuclear scientist. Listen, the way I see this was this was an attempt by either the U.S. or by Israel to basically tie the hands of Joe Biden when he comes into power. Because on the heels of the assassination of Major General Qasem Soleimani last January, this makes it very, very difficult for any political leader, particularly a, uh, particularly President Rouhani, he's going to be in power at least for the next six or seven months, for him to really seek any kind of diplomatic channel with the United States. And I think that's even, it also perhaps increases the likelihood that a, uh, in, the, in the next Iranian elections, I think it's next June, that a hardliner uh, will, will prevail in that election. And that I think serves, doesn't serve the strategic interest of Israel, it doesn't serve the strategic interest of the United States, but it does serve the political interests of the Trump administration and the current administration, current government in, in Israel. Um, so I think um, how that will play to GCC Iran relations, it's not going to help. It won't be helpful because if the U.S. hands are tied in terms of the way in which it can rebalance its role in the region, if it doesn't have a receptive Iran, 
then it's gonna be very, very difficult for the US to play that kind of more neutral, more balanced role that I advocated for. Um, I think there was another question about, and please cut me off when my three minutes are up. Uh, I think there was a question about the Civil War. <laughs> Have I run my three minutes? No, no, you have one okay. minute. Okay, so there was another question about the civil wars and what role they play. Um, I, think, I think I kind of covered that in my comments, uh, which was that the civil wars, which have drawn in all of the regional actors, Israel, Turkey, the Gulf Arab states, and Iran, that, the, that proxy dynamic has now increased the threat perceptions at the regional level. So in a way, what the civil wars have done, the individual civil wars have kind of almost created a, within this regional transformation that I spoke about, almost a regional civil war. And so the civil wars are now giving back to the region, even though the, 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 the major powers have been pushing conflict down to the civil war zones, but the civil, war, the civil wars basically have been spewing conflict out back. And so it's widened the conflict, creating that unvirtuous cycle that I mentioned. And I don't know if I've missed any of the questions. I wrote them down. Uh, I think there was one question about domestic structures, uh, which was a very interesting question that I can't cover in 20 seconds about the structure in Iran, uh, the way in which the regime is structured versus the way in which certain regimes are structured in the Middle East. Let's just say that there, since that the, that the that, listen, the relationship, be, the rivalry between the Gulf Arab states and Iran even predated the revolution. I, I'm old enough to remember the twin pillars policy of the Nixon administration when they were using pre-revolutionary, they were using Saudi Arabia and Iran as, a, as part of its containment uh, strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Soviet Union. And the Saudis always understood that Iran was the primary, was the real jewel, crown jewel in that, in that twin pillars policy. So there's always been a bit of insecurity, I think, uh, in that relationship. And that does, it's, it's structural and it's been exacerbated, became exacerbated after the revolution and it's become even more poignant and more exacerbated since the civil wars have kind of unraveled the region and the region has gone through this transformation. So I've tried to cover domestic politics, regional okay. politics in three minutes. You did well, you did well. <laughs> I tried. Thank you. Dr. Abdullah, if you have three to five minutes, please. Dr. Abdullah, you have three to five minutes, please. شكراً دكتور غانم. Thank you, Dr. غانم. هناك حزمة من ال. There is a bundle of questions. Actually, I will try to cover as many as I can. As as for relations between Iran and Oman, if there is a peace agreement with Israel. The state of Oman has uh, supported the peace agreements between UAE and Israel and Bahrain and Israel, but there are no indications, at least for the time being, that Muscat can go beyond that, Rubama, for uh, internal and political uh, uh, considerations. Uh, I can safely say that the public opinion of man is almost totally against that. This is something the government would have to take into consideration when taking a decision of this magnitude. There are no indications that for the time being, at least Muscat can go beyond mere support of the peace agreement. But if there is such an agreement, I don't think it will have a negative impact. We know the Omani foreign policy is very pragmatic indeed. And also the visit by Netanyahu in October 2018 to Muscat uh, did not impact the Omani-Iranian relations because Tehran did not show a strong reaction to that. So therefore, I think even if Muscat uh, uh, goes all the way to establishing a peace agreement with Israel, I don't think 
this will be there will be some diplomatic denial on the part of Tehran but uh, at the end of the day the commonality the interests between the two countries will make both countries keen on maintaining the relations between them there was a question about uh, what can uh, incite the gulf countries to move from a reactionary to a proactive role we have to understand the dispute between iran and the gcc in its core aspect iran has a project iran utilizes all its resources financial political and otherwise to fulfill and implement this project in comparison the gulf countries have no such thing until now all what they do is just mere reactions to what iran says or does they have no strategic parameters which are fully explained and agreed upon whereas iran moves through this project uh, musa says iran is stronger i think uh, i think uh, uh, the, the Gulf countries, if they uh, bring their forces together and become one bloc, they'll be very powerful. This, this, as as I said, Iran is not necessarily stronger. Iran has designed this project and utilized all its resources. But inside Iran, there are many points of weakness, economically, education, wise uh, and uh, also so far as the services provided by the state to the people but iran's point of strength is that iran has a project and it is utilizing all its resources to implementing it so how can the gulf countries move from uh, a reactive to a proactive role they should first of all get over this div divisiveness and division they should agree on a unified uh, uh, national security uh, project or architecture and if they the gulf countries just become or continue becoming captive to the american iranian uh, conflict they will continue suffering the question about the nature of any political system is has anything to do with the development of relations with iran yes of course the gulf countries uh, policies vis-a-vis -vis iran or any other country is, they do not necessarily reflect what the public opinion wants in these countries there is no popular income or proper political participation which is reflected in the Gulf countries' uh, policies. So if there are real constitutional reforms t taking place in the Gulf countries, then I think, consequently, the policies adopted by the states will be more reflective of the the interest of the people and the country instead of being just mere reflections of the ruling families and the individuals at the top of the helm of these countries half a minute please doctor the the cultural exchange or political exchange if this takes place i think it will produce outputs at the uh, political level which can influence the political minds and this can lead to more reconciliation between the gulf and iran now we move to mr juan call uh, there there is one late question about the role of turkey in addition to the other question. Uh, so with regard to uh, Turkey, 
a kind of Cold War has developed between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's a boycott of uh, Turkish goods now in Saudi Arabia. Uh, they are at daggers drawn, uh, backing different uh, factions in uh, in Libya. Uh, of course, uh, Turkey strongly backs Qatar, and Qatar just bought 10% of the Turkish stock exchange. Uh, and uh, so this is a completely different fissure uh, than the one between Saudi Arabia and its allies and Iran. Uh, and they don't overlap much. Uh, Turkey is on the GCC side with regard to Syria, uh, but uh, that hasn't turned into any kind of a warmth in the relationship. Uh, Turkey does not forgive uh, Mohammed bin Salman for assassinating uh, uh, Jamal Khashoggi uh, on Turkish soil in Istanbul and, and has leaked uh, damaging information over and over. So uh, that's a complicating wrinkle. Uh, it, it, however, seems to me to be a side show. Uh, the big conflict is still with Iran. And the thing about Iran that nobody has brought up is that the United States under Trump has launched a war on Iran, uh, an economic war. Uh, you know, in, in international law, if you brought a lot of ships up on somebody's shore and stopped them from trading, that would be an act of war. It would be recognized as a casus belli in international law. Well, the United States hasn't done it, uh, is, has done it through invisible means. Uh, they've slapped a financial sanctions on Iran, that, even on its central bank, to make it impossible uh, to trade with other countries. Uh, and got, has gone around uh, strong arming uh, Iran's um, importers of its oil uh, to not import Iranian oil. Uh, Reuters suggested that as of last May, Iranian exports of petroleum may be as few as 80,000 barrels a month. That's nothing. It was doing two and a half million barrels a day uh, exports uh, in spring of 2018 before Trump. Uh, breached the uh, Iran nuclear deal or the JCPOA. Uh, well, no country is going to be put up with being economically strangled that way. Uh, and why anybody would expect Iran to put up with that is beyond me. Uh, maybe the intent uh, is to provoke Iran to do, so, to do something rash so as to have a, 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 a pretext uh, for military action. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but people were asking me, what about negotiations? Until this blockade of Iranian finance and trade is lifted, uh, there is no prospect of peace. Uh, Iran will act out. It's already kind of tried to, to demonstrate to the UAE and Saudi Arabia that there will be a cost to trying to strangle the Iranian economy because the GCC is encouraging the United States in this path. Uh, this is war uh, by other means. Uh, and and the, the proxy battles that uh, Professor Harrison rightly pointed to are another means of, of Iran uh, acting out. Uh, basically, uh, from the Iranian side, what would be needed, uh, I think, is to go back to the JCPOA and have complete transparency on its nuclear program and to allow, uh, as it has been doing, uh, regular uh, and, and even unexpected UN inspections. Uh, I don't think there's any prospect of its giving up its nuclear program. Uh, and with regard to these geopolitical struggles, well, I, I think they may be coming to an end, some of them. Uh, it is clear that the rebel side has lost in, in Syria, or whatever you may think of that. And uh, the UAE has thrown in the towel to the extent of opening an embassy in Damascus. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit afraid uh, that Tony Blinken, who's coming in as Secretary of State, uh, has a severe animus against the Syrian regime and may try uh, to start back up uh, uh, the conflict. Uh, but as things now stand, Russia and Iran won this one. Uh, and even the, the some of the GCC is, is acknowledging that. Um, and uh, the Yemen war, again, 
as things stand, Saudi Arabia and the UAE have just lost, and uh, sooner or later. Okay, uh, Juan, please try to close in. We're going to have to come to negotiations. Yes. So I, I think that while there's no goodwill on any side for negotiations, I think uh, do you, the, the, the real politic is going to force them uh, to find some accommodations. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, panelists, uh, Ross Harrison, Juan Cole, Abdullah Al Ghilani. Uh, uh, remind you that uh, tomorrow sessions will start four o'clock Doha time, and uh, you are invited to register on the Arab Center's site through the Zoom application for those who want to participate. Everybody is welcome. We thank our audience today who've been with us on Zoom or on YouTube or social media. It was a very informative uh, uh, discussion, the presentations, the questions and answers. We had more questions than we have time for.